All right, and we're back. Back with episode 18. I think that's right, isn't it, John? Yeah. 18? I was surprised. Losing again. Uh, back, uh, World Strongest Opinions, episode 18 with Mike Adala. And Mike, man, I mean, you do a lot of stuff. So, <laughs> but I'm going to mention some, some big accolades. Um, you know, the Turkish Get Up World Record, which I was fortunate enough to uh, be in attendance for and witness. Amazing. You just recently completed the heaviest uh two hands anyway lift like old school old strongman style lift which is insanely impressive which was i think a total of 375 pounds um some other cool things you've done in the past and we can we can touch on briefly later is that crossing for cystic fibrosis i know is a huge uh um uh charity event out in florida uh but welcome to the show man it's awesome to have you here yeah, thanks so much for having me, Darren and John. I'm I'm looking forward to chatting with you guys and uh, spreading the spreading the the strength love. So thanks so much for having me. Thank you, yeah, man. And and as we always do, trash for treasure. I mean, that's that's the the trend right now, anyway. Um, as it always goes, I'm going to say, you know, something. I've got I've got six different uh, topics here. Um, we'll vote trash for treasure. Talk about why we feel about that, and just have a little bit of fun here for hopefully about the first 20 minutes. So the first one, trash or treasure, ice baths. Mike? <laughs> I'll say treasure. Treasure on ice bath. Um, not necessarily for the physical um, like recovery basis, but more for the, the mental and emotional recovery aspect <laughs> of it. I think, uh, you know, I, my background is very much in strength and conditioning, and a lot of people want to push themselves, and it's difficult to allow get to a place in strength where you can push yourself at least it's not applicable for every person but anyone can pretty much get into an ice bath and get that um that resistance that mental resistance and work on you know building what i would call perseverance grit and so for me it's a treasure awesome john yeah i 100 percent. i would say it's a treasure i think it's good for just like pushing yourself out of your comfort zone. It's a nice like reset. So yeah, I definitely yeah. agree. Yeah. I think treasure too. Um, well, I mean, very much in the same, uh, on the same page with Mike as I think they're, as far as recovery, I've never really noticed a lot. And I'm not like a big fan of like full cold immersion for recovery. If I've got, you know, aches or pains in my joints, I usually will go more towards isolated or localized uh, cold. But yeah, I mean, from the perseverance and building fortitude, uh, I think they're huge um, and they are in invigorating at least kind of temporarily. Uh, but, but yeah, I call them, I like call it, kind of colloquially call them like man makers, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Cause that's what it is. It's just, uh, just showing off how, how mentally tough you are to get into, into ice. Although I think rolling in snow is way colder. <laughs> <laughs> You'll learn a lot about a person um, when you invite them over for a nice bath to see yeah. their, their mental state, you know, sure. especially when it's very cold. Like there's a big difference with a hundred pounds of ice and 200 pounds of ice. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. We did them in the winter while it was snowing here recently. So that was like another level. I think it's mm -hmm. a little different doing it in the winter versus in the summer as well. <laughs> Definitely. And in the moving, if you go in real water, like real water, natural water, um, yeah. then it's a different level too. I about imagine. Yeah. Cause you're just getting constantly pounded. You know, your body heat is not warming up right around the, mm -hmm. the perimeter of your body or whatever. Yeah. Oh man. I haven't done that yet. <laughs> we'll have to jump in the Creek. Yeah, man. I, I would love to. Uh, I'm all about it. So treasure on ice baths, next one, voodoo floss, Mike. I've never voodoo floss. So I would say, I think it's beneficial for people. I would say treasure. I think I just don't have much of an opinion on it. Okay. John. And voodoo flossing, that's like the rubber bands that you Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Around. So Kelly right. Starr, well, I don't know if you I think a lot of people credit him with it, but Kelly Starr was a big advocate of it for quite a long time. Probably still is. I, I like the compression that it does, like just for like my quads and hamstrings, I'll do it sometimes. And then for like your forearm, if you have tendonitis, I feel like it helps at least like, I don't know. I feel like it's kind of, yeah, like it's a good compression. And it's way cheaper than like those Norma Tech things you can get for your legs or arms, like those. The inflatable. Like, yeah, the inflatable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's like a discount version of those, just a nice little rubber set. So I like yeah. it. 
I agree. Uh, I like voodoo floss. I don't think it's something that that has like an everyday purpose, but at least it, I mean, I think it. I think it makes me my joints feel better when they're having tendonitis, like you said. Whether it's like kind of placebo effect or if it's actually doing something, but yeah, that compression really tends to to help when I'm hurting. So definitely a treasure in my opinion. So treasures all around on voodoo floss. So right. Mike. I think that's a treasure as well. I had one of those a long time ago and um, <clears throat> I haven't used it so much recently, but being able to get like deep into my tissues, um, I think it's always really benefited me uh, with the so right or with a specific type of myofascial release tools. Yeah. John. Yeah. I'm a big fan. I left my so right in California at Scott Mendelson's gym when I was there. Oh, yeah. So I, I, now I have the hip hook. I bought it online. It's like a nice, it's like a slight variation where you can lay down and there's a little handle so you can apply more pressure or less oh, yeah. pressure and stuff. So I think mm -hmm. it helps in a way that like, it's hard to get in there and stretch it yourself, like certain things. Sure. So, yeah, sure. Big fan. Yeah. yeah I think, um, yeah, I think it's so right. I would give it a pocket treasure anyway, because I think there's so many other tools that work. Like I, like a like a softball, I think it's about as much work done for me. I mean, granted, it's only like, you know, unilateral. It's not both sides, both sides. But um, yeah, I think it's pretty pretty decent little tool. Pocket treasure, I like that one. Pocket treasure. That's John. John John coined that like I think in our first T R T treasure treasure <laughs> episode. So pocket treasure. Yeah. yeah, it's a good cop out because that way you're not it's, saying like it's a full size treasure. Yeah, <laughs> that's a cop out. That's a that's a on the fence. We'll call it a pocket treasure. <laughs> All right. Um, next one in, and, and and this is this is kind of CrossFitty, and we love CrossFit. We love trash on CrossFit on the show. Uh, but keeping pull ups, Mike. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would say trash. Okay. I'm going to go my first trash on keeping pull-ups. Um, from my opinion, <clears throat> I think a lot of people that want to do pull-ups, uh, strict pull-ups, will go to keeping pull-ups first and don't take the time to develop the correct strength and, you know, um, yeah, just the correct strength in order to do a pull-up and then learn the skill of keeping pull-up for the sport of CrossFit. Yeah. So yeah, they're, they're not necessarily bad, but like as what they are, but I think they're used a lot of times um, as a crutch. And sure. then there can be a lot of like um, lack of shoulder integrity, which then leads to obviously a lot of injuries and just weakness down the line. Yeah. And I mean, there's a lot of videos of people losing their grip and falling flat on their, on their heads too. Yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. <laughs> John, what do you think? Yeah, I would say you definitely have more benefits from like a regular pull up. And it is one of those things that like as someone who worked out at CrossFit gym, watching people alternate between like kipping pull ups and then like snatches. I'm like, that's real hard on the shoulders if you're not where you need to be skill and technique wise. So I would say trash. Yeah, uh, I think they're trash too. I kind of feel it. And it's odd because, you know, CrossFit. Overall, I mean, there, there's quite a bit of technical lifts in CrossFit nowadays, and and I kind of feel like keeping pull-ups are a remnant of early CrossFit when it was a little bit out of control, <laughs> right? <laughs> and 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 uh, and I think CrossFit, like I, at least I kind of like to to believe that they've advanced past that, and I'm surprised that kippings are keeping pull-ups are still utilized. But yeah, uh, I mean, it is a, it's a major cheat that. I would attribute more to strongman being cheaters than CrossFit nowadays. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is my opinion. Uh, yeah, I think they're trash. Um, and it's and it's the one thing I think that that CrossFit gets made fun of the most for the most these days. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. It's definitely the Achilles heel. Like if they got rid of that, it's like yeah, it's kind of like equip lifting. If you could hit depth on squats, people might be a little bit less aggressive towards the sport. Yeah. Yeah. Multi pull multi ply. Multi -ply. Yeah. yeah. Cause I mean, you want the IPF and the, and the single ply guys are you crushed. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So trash on keeping pull-ups. Um, paleo slash keto diet. 
Mike? I think it depends on, on their goal. Um, so I would say it could be a treasure. Definitely. Okay. John? Yeah. I mean, I think if done well, it can definitely, both of them can be helpful tools and stuff. I feel like for, I mean, it's kind of like the kipping pull-ups thing of like, if you do it wrong, it can definitely go poorly. And most people I know seem to do it wrong of like trying to be very strict about keto and then you go off of it and like have carbs and it just kind of like, you can't fully experience all the benefits unless you do it right. So I'd say if it's done well, it can be a treasure. Okay. Right. Yeah. I'm like, I'm not a big fan of fat diets, period. I think that they get abused and people misuse them. So, I mean, you're right. If it's used properly, you know, and it's, it's something that's, uh, you know, you're eating for your goals rather than eating because, you know, that's, I, I don't know. I just think fat diets just get, they just get out of hand and people start to abuse them. Like I, I was watching this video on social media the other day. The guy's like, he eats like one meal of nothing, but like, like an entire pound of bacon, all of the grease and, and like a dozen eggs or something. I can't, I don't know if it's that much, but he said it was like 1400 calories a day. Now the guy's lost a ton, a ton of weight, but I'm like, that's not because you're just eating fat and protein. It's because you're only eating 1400 calories a day mm -hmm. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. and only eating once a day, probably. I don't know. So, so yeah, I kind of, I feel like, uh, for the most part, fat diets are total trash. <laughs> Yeah, I think fat diet, I think paleo, like, I mean, paleo and keto are really different from my understanding, at least. So I would say if I'm picking between those, definitely paleo is more of a treasure. In my yeah. Opinion. Yeah. I just put them together because they're both like technically. Yeah. Paleo doesn't necessarily have to be zero or extremely low carb, but I think a lot of times it tends to be. So mm -hmm. that's kind of why I threw them together. But yeah, they are a bit different. You're right. Keto is just Atkins diet for the modern age, <laughs> more, more, more or less, more or less, more or less. So, um, all right. Well, I mean, you guys, you guys will set treasure, so I'll give it to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Last one. And, and I think, you know, we probably know what the answer is here, but, uh, smart watches slash like fit, fit watches, Mike. I'd say, I mean, I'm wearing one right now, so I got some yeah. treasure. Yeah, I think it depends on the goal, what you're trying to use it for. Um, I'm actually training for an ultra marathon. And yeah. so it's really helpful for me to to kind of understand like what my body's doing while I'm running um, because that's new for me. So like the more input I have, uh, it can be helpful to modulate my training. Um, so for me, it's a treasure. I, I could definitely see I could be trash if someone's just like constantly, you know, worshiping the watch. Right. And not able to listen to their own body. Um, I'm really against that. But um, in terms of getting some feedback and then how you ma manipulate that feedback, I think can be a treasure. Yeah. John? Oh, yeah. I would say I did use a smartwatch for the longest time, but after a while, found it was a little bit distracting and... I was listening to my body more than what it said, but I still like when I work out, especially if I'm doing some sort of like cardio, I like to have the heart rate monitor because I think it's important to understand if you're actually pushing yourself because it's easy to either push yourself too much more than you should, or you're actually not pushing yourself enough if you actually look at how your heart's performing. So I think it can be a very valuable tool as long as you're not getting like obsessed with it to the point where you feel good, but then your watch is giving you different feedback. And yeah, so I'd say definitely kind of like my theme for today of it, it when used well, it's a treasure. Yeah. Um, and I'm actually, I'm wearing a basic one here. Um, yeah, I think they're, I think they're a treasure. I think they have a long ways to go still to be, you know, um, in some regards, like the, I think the sleep cycle is pretty accurate, which is what I use mine mostly for to see how I'm sleeping and, and try to improve my, my rest. You know, HVR is pretty accurate. Uh, the heart rate monitor is pretty accurate, but you know, things like calories are all over the place. Um, I don't think it's, I mean, I have no idea what the, uh, the accuracy of it. I mean, some days I'll, I'll work out and it'll tell me I've burned like 500 calories less than a day that I was sedentary. So mm -hmm. <laughs> pretty inaccurate. So they got a long ways to go on that. 
Um, and, you know, because they're attached to your wrist, uh, at least mine doesn't uh, actually know all the time when I'm working out. Like if I'm squatting, it has no clue. I mean, it, I mean, it can tell that my, my heart rate has gone up a little bit, but it doesn't know that I'm moving or doing any exercise. And so it doesn't, doesn't trigger the monitoring for, for sports or exercise. And, you know, that's because it's the, the algorithm is, um, and the device is, is meant to uh, activate or, recognize wrist movement rather than full body movement. And that's, you know, I know there's people that are working on uh, smart devices that connect maybe to your thigh or something along those lines. But yeah, I think they're, I think they're treasure and I think they're developing technology that hopefully in the future will be much more accurate and provide a lot of really good data. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I will say if you're wearing a heart rate watch and just going off the heart rate on the watch, that yeah. is trash. You have yeah. to have a chest strap. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're you're right. And that that's um that's difficult. I mean, I only use mine for any type of like, just really for running. That's the only time I'll really use it. Um, or like if I'm doing a bike ride, something where I need to modulate my heart rate. Sure. If I'm lifting, I'll usually take it off. Okay. Yeah. Um. So I mean, I checked mine. And I mean, it's my, mine's pretty accurate, actually. I mean, I've checked my, I've done like a manual read, um, you know, on my wrist and it's, you know, maybe one or two beats off per minute. Um, I've actually put my uh, blood pressure cuff on and it's been actually almost right on also. So yeah, I think there's a little bit of variability, but yeah, so far mine's actually been somewhat pretty accurate, honestly. But is I do know that the, the the chest strap is much much more accurate. Is it accurate when your heart rate's like eighty plus per, eighty plus percent of off your max? So I haven't actually just checked at accuracy there. I probably should. It's usually just I'm checking it when I'm when I'm sedentary, just at mm -hmm. rest. Yeah. yeah, I think it's I, fairly. I agree with you on, at rest. Yeah, at rest, and that's usually what I'm more concerned about. Usually, I'm just kind of looking at what my resting heart rate is. And, mm -hmm. That's what interests me at this point, but yeah, I should probably check the accuracy when my, uh, yeah, when I'm eighty percent plus of my max. Be curious to see how that goes. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you know. Okay, <laughs> nice, cool, man. Yeah, so uh, definitely chose around the fit watches, and yeah, I mean that's fun. I mean that was a little shorter, well, just about twenty minutes. So, we're kind of getting getting to where we want to go. Um, but uh, let's talk about you, Mike. Let's um, kind of start, you know, I mean, you do, you're kind of an all around, just very athletic and well-rounded guy, um, which is like insanely impressive to me, you know, being around powerlifting and strongman and now seeing CrossFit and, you know, and I've always had this kind of mindset that, you know, I have to train for the sport that I'm competing in, which I mean, yeah, to some extent, but I'm learning more and more and more, especially seeing guys like you that, that are just like, I mean, you're incredibly explosive. I mean, you know, I know we talked a little bit, you don't think your overhead's very strong, but I disagree. <laughs> very, very powerful. I mean, it, and you know, I mean, you prove that with your two hands anyway, lift. Um, I mean, your body weight exercises, you know, handstands and all that. You can elaborate on that. Um, Kind of tell us a little bit more about like your background and kind of what your philosophy um, for for training and and life is. Yeah. All right. Ooh, big questions. I love big it. Question. Okay. Well, let's start with training. Um, I would say you know I like how you just described that there's these different sports and that you'll focus on building strength in that sport. And what I've really come to to do is figure out what's the strongest way that I can build my body period. And mm -hmm. a lot of that, and it's different, like in upper body, I believe it's the like gymnastics rings, like being able to really control my body and do strict gymnastics ring routines and control myself there. Um, I did a, a program where I just did two months of that. And then I PR'd my bench and I never touched my a bench during that whole time. Um, versus if I, if I just go on the bench, then obviously get stronger. And I think it's different in terms of like max, maybe max strength, but anyway, that's a little bit about body weight and, and handstands is something that uh, I'm a huge proponent of. 
I guess I'm trying to figure out where to start with your question. I'll start in the beginning. So <laughs> I, in high school, <clears throat> I just did a lot of bro lifting, just wanted to be big and yeah. strong. You know, I was maybe a six foot and like 180 pounds. And then my senior year, I was 190. And my I got recruited to play football at, in Division three, And I was a corner and a quarterback in high school. And they recruited me to play middle linebacker. And so I looked at the roster. These guys are, you know, taller than me and like 50, 60 pounds heavier than me. And I was like, I'm going to get destroyed. I need to get, I need to figure out how to get bigger. And one of my buddies was working out with um, this Russian coach doing Olympic weightlifting. And I never heard of Olympic weightlifting before. And so I went with him one time and I worked out in his basement and his name's Mark Chasnov. And he had just a platform in his basement, like down an old, like kind of like moldy staircase around the corner. And he had, I didn't notice at the time, it was like all Elikio plates, like the nicest bars. I, he, I think he might have, actually, he told me the other day, he's like, I have the best sets of weights in the United States, like the vintage stuff, newer stuff, just, but it was all stacked up in a crawl space. And so we're like pulling yeah. it out of the crawl space. And then for the first two months, I, um, I didn't put any weight on the bar. And so he really taught me how to like the technical aspect of, of weightlifting. Mm-hmm. And it was cool. It was kind of like, like a Mr. Miyagi type of situation and like yeah. his dojo. And it was like, you take the bar off the wall and it was like, take like the sword off the wall. You place it on the ground, never drop it, never kick it with your foot, never step over it, never walk in front of someone else lifting. You just sit in the metal chair while your buddy's going through the lifts, working through the positions. And so after two months of that, now we start to put weights on. And we're doing squats and and benching and some pressing like while we're training the skill as well. Um, And then I clean and jerk over 300 pounds as an 18 year old. And he told me, if you want to get bigger, just you need to eat more food. And so every night after your regular meal, eat a rotisserie chicken. And so I just ate a chicken for like three three months straight and gained 40 pounds. (laughs) Um, I don't think I would do that again because I gained so much weight that when I was running, which is like obviously more important uh, in football, uh, my, like my ligaments and my tendons weren't used to all that weight. And so I strained like my groins and my hamstring, but um, I really got into strength and conditioning there. And so the New York jets came to my college for training camp and I met with their strength coach and I, they asked if anyone on a football team wanted to be an intern. And that was my dream. So I was like, yes, I'll be there 5, 5 a.m. Let's work 16 hour days for training camp. And it was great. They never had a, an intern before. Um, and so they were like, you're a coach. Go teach Ladanian Tomlinson how to do kettlebell swings. Go do this. And along with all of the regular intern stuff. But yeah. the, uh, the attention to detail started to continue there because the strength coach at the time, Sal Alosi, was so <laughs> detail oriented that um, we built out a strength room in the hockey arena and so there's like 16 different racks and every rack had to be exactly the same like obviously all the weights have to be the same the bars on the same everything aligned in the same way all the weights facing the same direction but then when you would go and tie um like bands onto the racks for like rotations or whatever all the band knots had to be facing the same way and so you could just walk into the gym and look and just see if something was off but that attention to detail um carried over again I never even put this together before. So thanks for yeah. letting me talk about it. It's helpful. <laughs> it's the uh, carried over into, um, so I did two seasons with the Jets and then went to Athletes Performance, which is Exos now um, for NFL Combine Prep. And so now the, you know, the best athletes in college football are going to this facility to learn how to run a faster 40, 5, 10, 5, yeah. bench, shuttle, whatever. And so when you're watching, you know, um, Julio Jones or JJ Watt run 40 yard dash. And they're looking at you like, what'd you see? You know, they're, it's like, we're just working on a 10 yard start. And so that developing the eye to be able to notice like movement inefficiencies there and then get feedback um, really taught me how to one, see that as a coach, but then also how to feel it within my own body and see like what's off, what's on and, and work that attention to detail. And so I went back home to New York, worked as a strength and conditioning coach, uh, for more high school, college athletes. And then I really got into like holistic health and wellness. Um, I traveled around the world studying wellness and, and health and, you know, what makes people happy and healthy. And then 
and got back and taught yoga, did a yoga teacher training, got really into handstands, calisthenics, a lot of partner acrobatics. Um, that's super fun. Like using strength to lift other people up overhead yeah. and flip them and stuff like that. Um, it's more like cir- like circus type of, of stuff. Sure. And then now I kind of like, just like to play with different modalities. And so I'll develop my strength and then I'll apply the strength and see what is a skill that I want to learn. And so something like handstand is really fun because there's endless skills. Right. Um, I would say if someone can hold like a strict one arm handstand for like 10 seconds, like control it in the middle of the room, they're a little bit strange as an individual because that time that it takes to dedicate to that is like tremendous amount of time. Yeah. And it's like just so focused on like this one thing, very obsessed. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so now, now I like to play around with different modalities. There's certain things that I have a lot of experience on. And then, so now I'm pretty good at like keeping my arms straight. Uh, so I can hold a lot of weight overhead. Um, and then just understanding like how to manipulate my body and create tension so that I can put that force into the ground or the bar or whatever I want to put it into. Yeah. I mean, the amount of weight that you can hold head overhead with one hand is, is insane. <laughs> You know, and, and like, I don't know, I don't know that I hope everybody realizes how insanely impressive your two hands anyway is, uh, I mean, you make it look so easy. And I mean, just the, just a shoulder mobility alone to be able to bend over and maintain the stability with uh, 300 pounds in one hand is pretty incredible um i would count myself statically fairly strong um you know i compete at the top of my game and i can't even do that barely with 135 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. so yeah i mean um i mean what do you what do you do to work on that i mean to to make sure that your mobility is i mean do you just kind of credit that to the just the training style i mean are you doing something specific to um, you know, ensure that your mobility stays, you know, I don't know what, what word to use, uh, probably for that elastic maybe so that you can perform these incredible feats. Yeah. I think for me, I kind of look at the feet and then where am I at in terms of my mobility and do I need to work on it or uh, am I able to do it? And I, I used to, to a lot of yoga, a lot of <clears throat> like mobility work. And so that's kind of like in my body. And so if yeah. I might tighten up from running like now, then and yeah. I want to get into something else, it just takes me a little bit of time to kind of open back up and then, and then I'm there. But um, yeah, it's just, it's just applying those things based on the skill or whatever I'm trying to do, or I get like, excited or enthusiastic about. Yeah. And, and what kind of, like influenced you to start pursuing something like, like this two hands anyway. I mean, I know you've been doing a little bit of like the side uh, or bent presses too. I mean, you've been doing a little bit more like old school strongman. What kind of influenced you to, to get into all that? Yeah, the old school strongman for sure. Like uh, Arthur Saxon, looking up, googling on online, seeing all these old lifts. Like what what's possible? Um, what looks interesting? Um, I, I got into maybe like three years ago. Like learned about Zercher deadlifts and just different types of like Arthur or Anderson squats. And then I would kind of like just put different things together and play with like you know what's the most I can. I, th- I think it's called what's it what's the deadlift that's between the legs jefferson yeah jefferson uh, jefferson yeah i'm like what could i like split jefferson press. split squat so i put my back foot up on a bench and then just come down pick up the bar and then stand up so they take weird stuff like that it's like fun for me to yeah just to get curious about and then yeah train and, and play with and i think like the training and playing gets kind of th- like it's good to define those. Like you can play if you've trained. Yeah. I mean, just to, at a different level, you can obviously play if you haven't trained, but in order to do certain things, it requires a certain amount of, of background. And, um, sure. and so if I don't, if I'm able to play the game that I want to play, then I need to spend more time strengthening the things I want. I need to strengthen. 
Yeah, man. Um, and John, if you got something, jump in. I don't oh, know. yeah. No, I, I was just <laughs> saying, I think it's interesting you just like looking at your website and going through like what you do. I think that holistic approach is so important because I think people get kind of like can box themselves into a corner in a way of like thinking this is the specific thing I'm doing. Like this is the specific thing I'm training. Whereas I think kind of like incorporating that whole body and holistic mentality, I think obviously has paid off hugely as far as strength goes, but I think also I would say like that body awareness that you you've developed through doing all those movements is impressive. But, um, yeah. How would you go about trying to introduce someone to these things or how do you work with clients on trying to get them to approach things with a more holistic performance mindset? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great question. So, um, aside from the, like, I make a lot of analogies with strength training and then the performance coaching that I do, which is more like, um, it's, it is performance. Like it's a lot of flow state coaching. So how can we get people to, use their biology in a way that's going to allow them to perform in their job or in their relationships or in their training in the best way possible. And so the first step is eliminating the things that you don't care about. So you can have more capacity to focus on the things that you do. And so it's it's very similar with training or like a handstand as an example. A lot of people have enough strength and mobility to hold themselves upside down at the wall. But what they lack is the focus to be able to hold that in the middle of the room because the signal from their brain to their body right as they're falling and then make that micro adjustment to pull back in is what they're lacking. And so you're never actually ever balancing a handstand. You're always rebalancing it because you're constantly falling. You're constantly making these micro adjustments. And so it's very similar with the coaching that I'll do in more lifestyle aspects of like, you know, we're always needing to make these micro adjustments to be able to move towards the direction that we want to go. Um, and then defining what that direction or goal is just like we would if we wanted to hold a 30 second handstand nice so i think that's great what are you gonna say darren no i was gonna say it's i mean it's a very interesting concept i mean you know i actually probably think about that but just standing probably requires the same but it's so you're so accustomed to it right your whole life walking on your feet that you probably don't realize like you're constantly making micro adjustments just to stay on your feet right because i mean we all have to learn how to balance Mm-hmm. And so it's just, I mean, you're almost learning how to walk again on your hands, right? I mean, more or less. Definitely. I mean, there was a time I did a practice where I would just jump up and down, like really small, shake my body for 10 minutes and then stand for another 10 minutes. And it brought like the weirdest sensations that like, I almost felt like I was going to fall over because I'm yeah. not used to doing that. And so um, I, I have a pretty good balance now. I don't spend a lot of time on balancing on both of my feet, but I'll do a whole ton of unilateral work. Yeah. And so a lot of stability. And I think the thing that, um, that people don't really focus enough on, or at least I don't see it, is developing that stability, especially um, yeah, in general, but definitely on one leg and then definitely on their, on their hands and the shoulder. And so if I put you guys in a plank, <clears throat> and I have you externally rotate your upper part of your arm, internally rotate the lower part of your arm, push down this first knuckle, do 50% of each of those, and then push hard into the ground, and then isometrically pull your hands towards your feet, flex your quads, squeeze your glutes. Like there's so much tension there. Like you can hold that for 10 seconds, you max out. But now if I take that same tension and hold it for a push up, now I go to do a handstand push up. Oh, I can, mm, I have all of that tension. Where it would be like if you're trying to do an overhead press and you're just not taking a breath, you're just relaxing, you're not going to be able to press as much. And so getting that like intra-abdominal pressure with body weight movements, then when I'm holding the barbell over my head, I'm not just like holding it. You know, I'm pushing it, I'm rotating it, I'm locking it, I'm pushing through it. And all of that comes down to allow me to hold, you know, that 300 pounds. Sure. I think that's you. Great job. Yeah, no, because I think it's interesting you talk about those micro adjustments that you don't think about of like my old coach, Eric Carlson, had me on like deadlift days. One of the prep things was you would do the toe threading, but then you would do single, you would stand on one leg and try to balance for a minute. But you, he's, his thing is you had to have your eyes closed. And it's weird how much you think of your balance based on what's around you. Like it's this idea 
of like being against a wall standing on one leg with your eyes open you can kind of keep balance but as soon as you close all you have is your body awareness and it's interesting because you've realized like that mm -hmm. sense of falling you if your eyes are open you can kind of see where you're going and i think that's very underrated that ability of thinking how are you actually staying stable and like where is your body at any given moment is interesting and i like that you tied it into like the performance coaching for life because oftentimes i think we don't practice these things that we feel like we know how to do of like oh i know how to stand up i know my balance whereas like with life you would do these little micro adjustments if you don't even realize what you're not doing until you start doing it like you're saying with those handstands like i mean the one for life is values right like how many people can just name boom these are my values bam 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 and then this is how they show up in my schedule bam 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 versus a lot of times you know i always use this deathbed value exercise and so if you think of yourself you know 50 100 years from now in your deathbed and you look back on your life of what would be a life that you know dan and john would be proud of what are the activities that i'm doing they're probably things like time with my family, focus on my health and wellness, impact I have on the world, being a good person. Um, and now you take those values and you overlay them with how you spent your last two weeks. And you see what in the last two weeks have I done that's not equal to, you know, those deathbed or like memento mori values. And I don't obviously don't know what it is for you guys, but for a lot of people, they're spending time streaming TV or Netflix or social media or doing other vices that they're not proud of. And so then when they tell me I have no time, it's like, you know, it's not a time problem. It's a value problem. And so, and it's usually just a definition problem because it's not that you don't have the values, just you don't have a system that's working to apply them into your life. And so it's very similar with, with training. It's like, you want to get stronger. Okay. How do you want to get stronger? What are the ways they need to strengthen? How much time do you have? What equipment do you have? What coaching do you have? What, all of those things. And then you can create a program for that. That's what I do with performance coaching um, in, in a more lifestyle application. Oh, I think that's really great because there is that idea of, I think oftentimes if you're not really looking at things and like examining things, you can just lose a lot of time. Like as far as streaming and stuff goes, like it was interesting a few years ago, I made the decision that I of course, I'm still going to watch a lot of Netflix because like Darren knows he suggested the show Dark. We just finished it. It's a great <laughs> show and stuff. So there's a lot on there. But one of the things I did to try to moderate it is I don't rewatch anything anymore because I realized how easy it was to like fall into that kind of the comfort and stability of rewatching old episodes of The Office or Parks and Recreation. This kind of like I, I don't know, kind of with neuroplasticity of like going through the comfortable paths in your mind of like what's comfortable and familiar, you kind of create this area of, I don't know how to describe it, but kind of like some people talk about like the window of tolerance. You realize that the more you stay in your comfort zone, the harder and more static these barriers appear for your life. And it's harder to go outside those comfort zones. So I think that's interesting to think of like the memento mori value system of thinking like, how is this actually contributing to my goals? Like you can say this, uh, like X is a value to you, but if you're not doing anything for it, is it really a value to you? Yeah. Or like, yeah. And it also depends on what is it you want? You know, like, I love that we're on this uh, world's strongest opinions podcast. I could make it the strength analogies is like, if someone comes into the gym and they say, I want to be the absolute strongest possible version of myself then you're like okay cool this is exactly what you need to do in order to make that happen and it would be like i want to live the absolute best possible life i can for myself or i want to live better than i'm living now i want to have i want to be growing a little bit in that direction and then like modulating kind of think of it as like a dj like on the toggles of like okay where can i move things around to be able to you know help this person move themselves in the direction they want to go I think that's good. Like Darren and I have talked about things of kind of this idea. And when we had um, Atlas Power Shrugged on, who's a big fan of you, we're talking about like, and he's talked about it before of like, remember why you're lifting of like, keep the fun in it. Kind of like you talk about like having that play element, because I think so often, like we had touched on it briefly with the diet thing 
of the issue with the keto diet and many things that people will take on is if you allow it to like become kind of rigid and make you miserable, what's the whole point of it? Like your training and these things, like it should be <laughs> like if most everything you should be doing should be edifying and improving your life. And if it's not, then find a different way to do it or reevaluate what you're doing. So I think that's, it's just fascinating going through your page of like thinking of like performance for your whole life of like, it's not just like athletic performance, but how can you generally maximize your things? So if you, like you had a post recently talking about like allowing other people's expectations to kind of shape your view of like, or even your own expectations of kind of letting it make you miserable. I think it's very important of like your message <laughs> of like try trying to make it improve your life overall. Mm -hmm. It's just like the strength stuff I think is very fascinating. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, it's um, the first step that I work with clients on is like defining the mindset that they have. Is it a growth mindset or a fixed mindset? And so if it's fixed, then it's going to be really difficult to create any type of growth because there's no ownership over the decisions that they're making. And one of the, the best ways that I love talking about and I talk about every day with clients is taking ownership over language. And a word that you've used a lot, John, right now is should. Should I do this? Should I do that? Should it be this way? Should it be that way? A should is pure expectations based on the outside world. I should be strong because... And I love Atlas Strong too. And so I'll just use him as an example because you made because you mentioned him, but like because he's doing Zercher deadlifts, I should do that too. Well, do I want to do that or do I not want to do that? Oh, I want to explore what that feels like. Okay, cool. Now I'm empowered. I'm the one, you know, driving the decisions that uh, for my life. And then that helps me take ownership in all different areas. And like ones that, in my opinion, are a lot more important than a uh, search deadlift, which would be like, do I want to have a difficult conversation with my kids? Do I want to have a difficult conversation with my family or my partner? And so that was, um, that was a big thing for me. I always say, I love the conversations between the field house and the weight room as I'm walking back in with the athletes and like life is they're talking about how they're struggling, how they want to like cheat on their partner, how, you know, like the real stuff's coming up that, <clears throat> you know, we can push as much weight as we want and try to create a shield around our hearts with the with our big chest. But at the same time, like that isn't what we deeply want. And so there's nothing wrong with pushing weights. Obviously I love to do it. Um, but it's just why you're doing the things that you're doing. That's a fantastic question to ask yourself. Yeah. I like that you say, or you kind of pointed out the should, cause like I, I, I struggle that. And I don't always uh, verbalize it exactly the way it's playing out in my head, but, but I'm like, I always kind of see, you know, the shoulds, like, especially in the fitness community, there's always, there's always like, you know, you've got all these different like training styles and coaches and everybody, and everybody's always saying that everybody should be doing this. And well, no, I mean, people should be doing what, what is going to match their goals, right? You, you shouldn't be doing X, Y, Z. Um, you need to be doing what's what is appropriate for your goals and, and your lifestyle. Right. And that's how I kind of going back to like fad diets too. So I don't like fad diets because they, they tend to be this one size fits all that really doesn't fit everybody. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, in society, we have a tendency to get really kind of trapped in those kind of silos of, of expectation, right. Of what, you know, family expects of us, what, the, what we perceive the world expects of us. And not doing what we need to do, right? So I, I really, I appreciate that that kind of uh, definition of of should. <laughs> I kind of keyed in on that word, right? Should what it should is, we do? What what should we do versus what we need to do or what we want to do? Yeah, <clears throat> I think even like a need can be tricky too, and yeah. it's like a detail thing. But it's, we're detail people, especially in, in the weight room. We're focusing on all of those details, so it makes sense that we would want to carry that over in our life. And the the best way I've found is a like firm elimination on the word should. Like there's literally no place for it in my yeah. life ever. And so. Uh, it's a gray word. And so I want to make either black or white. Like I want to do this or I don't want to do this. And it's hard yeah. when for 51% I do and 49% I don't. It's like, those are tough decisions, but those are decisions that I can ultimately make, see how they feel. Um, and then I can make another decision and adjust from there. Sure. Do you not think that maybe 
from from a want perspective, though, there's there's kind of a a, a line that I mean, I, I guess I, you know, I'm I'm big on individual responsibility and individual choice, right? That people you know can do whatever they want at the end of the day. But sometimes you have people that want very negative things, also, right? Which you know subsequently may have negative impacts on the people around them. So so even wants have like. I mean, don't you think that even having want sometimes has a limit where, you know, and, and again, need is subject, can be subjective, want can be subjective. There's kind of a, a fine line in between where, where you know, need, need and want become positive, I guess is what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I agree. There are like psychopaths and people in this world that we can't, I can, we can't control them. And right. so I want to create a place that, um, is as healthy as possible. I think that we all want to feel good. And we just think that, I mean, I'll use training. Like, do I want to wake up at 5 a.m. and go right into the ice bath? No, I don't want to do that. I want to sit in the bed. But yeah. do I want to develop, like, you know, uh, personal discipline, integrity with myself? Yes. Do I want that more than the comfort of the bed? Yes. And so I get up and go do it. Yeah. Uh, but do I want to do that last set? Not really. But I want the results more. And so it comes down sure. to, like, What's the deeper, what's the deeper thing here? Sure. Sure. No, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, man, I wanted to stay in bed today too. <laughs> <laughs> I was like laying there. Like I, I'm actually, I'm, I'm in between jobs right now. I start my new job on the 20th and I'm like, Oh man, I need to start getting, I need to start getting up and getting myself custom being up earlier again. And I'm like, I really want to sleep in, but I need to start getting up. <laughs> Yeah, you try to take you try to take away the negotiation with myself because I'm so good at negotiating with myself that I'll spin anything into a way that goes to like you know, um, like a softer version. And so I think there's times to be you know vulnerable or soft or, or whatnot, sure. but um, not when I'm going after the life that I really want and that um, I'm proud of. I want to go for that like full on. Yeah. Yeah, man, that's admirable. Uh, I, I know I struggle with that. I mean, I mean, I've been pretty successful in, in, in a lot of things, but yeah, I mean, I always look back. You're right, and, and man, I waste a lot of time every day, but I still manage to get the things done that I want. But I'm like, how much better can I be if I could just eliminate these last little, you know, time wasters, these vices, like straight, like I just. Like TikTok, man. I've never had a TikTok. And I just decided to install it recently. And I'm like, I told my wife last night, I'm like, I'm uninstalling this. Because it is like consuming my freaking, my life right now. Because I, I can't stop scrolling. Yeah, because there's, like, I mean, it's the biggest companies in the world, right? Are spending like the most money trying to gain your attention. And yeah. it's not even just the time that they're stealing from you. It's, and it's me too. I struggle. The, the reason I teach all this stuff and talk about it is because I struggle with it. So sure. I'm like, that was the ultimate shooter. And now I've like really worked on, on developing that. And that's why I like to talk about it a lot and, and share that message. But, um, you know, these apps, uh, they have a ton of that, that money and they're not only taking the time, but they're taking their ability to think about the things that you want to think about. Yeah. So and this is kind of like a little tangent, but I think it's helpful in this, in, in this conversation is one of the best things I've done for myself was um, in terms of getting clarity was spending extended time out in nature. Yeah. Um, without any types of distractions uh, going on like a, I call it a soulful quest where I just fasted too out in the mountains in New Mexico and allowed like me to come back to me. Like, what are these things that I really want? And I spent the time in the most honest and truthful place that there is, which is w wild places because animals aren't going to lie. Trees not going to lie. The grass going to grow when it's watered and there's sun. And so I'm looking for my own truth. I go to the, the truth, but if there's, Again, if we're ingesting things that we don't necessarily want and are just like, it's like fast food for our brain. It's kind of yeah. how, I, how I view it. I call it electric crack. There you go. That's good. <laughs> uh, and the, the companies know this, though. I was reading like the Chinese version of TikTok. It doesn't work between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. And it only lets you use it for 45 minutes a day. The app just doesn't work after. And I was like, it's interesting because <laughs> they're like, oh, we definitely don't. We want productive, happy citizens. So we're not going to have instant access to garbage all the time. And it's interesting because here with 
uh, this idea of Darren always talks about it, that idea of personal responsibility, when everything's left up to personal responsibility, it becomes you are the one who has to set those like hard deadlines because it is easy. And I'm glad you said the should because uh, it's interesting. My therapist <laughs> has said that before because she was like, you're a very high performing person, but you have a ton of shoulds in your mind and it can be overwhelming. Whereas in reality, it's like what do you need to do and what do you really want to do of that idea of, and kind of Darren touched on it, that idea of like, you want to sleep in, but you want to have a productive day more ideally you want to feel accomplished at the end of the night also if i sleep in too much it feels great in the morning but then boy do i regret it at 11 p.m when i'm not tired at all and know that i need to be in bed so i think kind of balancing those things and i think it's interesting you talk about helping people kind of prioritize their values and think how how does this actually align of trying to frame things through your value lens rather than just a list of shoulds because it is overwhelming. I have a, so many things like a thousand shoulds of, Oh, I should try that. I should do this. And that's kind of what sells of like people, you see it everywhere of like athlete X and so many fitness people. They're like five movements. Everyone should be doing every day. And you add up enough shoulds. It's just paralysis after a bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, what I think is cool, like when you define like a coach versus a trainer versus a consultant versus a mentor, it's like a coach is someone who's really supposed to help their clients discover the things that they want and help like you give certain maps or models or a framework for them to do the things that they want to do versus tell them what they need to do, which would be more of like a consulting or training them on a process that they could help them go on something. And the struggle with that is, yeah, it doesn't necessarily totally work and if a, in a large scale kind of process because it's more individual, but it works really well for the individuals that are there. Um, but all types of marketing, is, it's all shoulds. So you should look this way, you should have this, should have that. And um, yeah, obviously I'm big anti-should, but it, it's hard to develop those, those filters. And I really believe the people that are one, most successful in the gym and most successful in life are the ones who are able to kind of have those boundaries around what they don't allow in so that they can focus on the things that they do. Like you can just tell when Darren's in the gym working out, he's not there to like have a conversation, like he's there to work out. And then maybe at the, at the, on like the, when he's leaving or before you could like catch him for something, but he's just very focused. And that's why he's able to accomplish the amazing things that he can accomplish. Yeah. Um, and so there's, take that same thing. Yeah. There's other aspects to that though, too, that I think are important to note is, is I, you know, I, I intentionally put myself in a place where I can do that too. I removed myself from environments where people were too much of a distraction Mm-hmm. Um, you know and I mean? Where I'm at now in V23, that environment is much more conducive to me being able to be focused in, in training. Whereas in, you know, other gyms, um, it's harder to avoid that, that constant conversation, wasting time. And so there's still that conscious effort and decision that if I want to meet my goals, I have to remove myself from, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to say it's unhealthy per se, but it's unproductive environment. Mm-hmm. Put myself in an environment that it matches my goals. And so, so I mean, that's all kind of a conscious construct, uh, um, kind of construct of mine. It's like yeah. putting myself where I can be that person. You know, I'm not, cause I'm not just that way. I I'm, I'm as uh, vulnerable to distraction as anybody. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Totally. See, yeah. I mean, I'm grabbing this thing right here. This is a, a phone. This is a light phone. And it's a dumb phone. It just does calls, text, basic GPS. Nice. And yeah. so this is the same same idea that you were just saying in the gym. If I constantly have my smartphone, then I'm in an environment with distraction. But if yeah. I want to not be distracted, then I put something in place that allows me a different type of environment. That's smart. Yeah. I mean, I, I turn all my notifications off and everything, but yeah, tick tick TikTok still like <laughs> threw me in really quick, but that's gone. <laughs> I'm done with that. Like I was wasting too much time for like the last week. Like I'm done with this. This is ridiculous. It's not. It's not helping me accomplish anything. Yeah. Totally waste of time. But yeah, I mean, even with notifications off, you know, I'll, I'll still check 
everything, you know, a couple times a day. Cause I'm like, Oh, I wonder what's happened, you know, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And in some, and in some ways I wish, you know, I said it a million times and it'd be nice to live in a, in a world where you couldn't, you didn't have to rely on it at all, but I mean, even work nowadays is relying on internet and connectivity. But, but that's like getting back to you. I mean, I, I started spending more time in nature last year too. find, you know, put, intentionally putting myself in places where nobody can get a hold of me. I don't have connectivity. There's no signal. I can be left alone, be at peace, kind of reset. And, you know, and I'm hoping to do a lot more of that this year too, because I do, I think that's super important. And, and there's a lot of people that don't, I mean, they, they, they've grown up now in this world where they know nothing else, but 24 seven, you know, connection to the, to the internet, you know, to the world. And, and they just can't fathom themselves being, you know, somewhere without that. And, Mm -hmm. and I don't think people realize how freeing and how like liberating it is just to be by yourself. Yeah. And even how much more, how much more productive they can actually be too. Like taking that same idea and then putting into daily practice. Uh, I work with a lot of clients on like 90 minute work blocks. And so getting into like how they can trigger a flow state in their work, maintain that flow state and then get out of it and then recover and take 15 minutes of staring at a wall or going out for a walk without their phone or doing a breath work on the ground, getting that same type of feeling and then coming back into work, they might be working, you know, I don't know, half the hours that they were working before, but they're way more productive, like five times more productive. And they feel so much better about it also. And I mean, there's so many um, analogies, like putting that in with the gym. Like, I think the people that, especially skill-based things, they take time to be able to focus on that skill. And like, um, in order to recognize like, the delicacies of maybe that's not the right word, but like the intricacies of like where they're holding something or how they're holding a handstand and have the a ment- mental capacity to fight for that or plyomet- the single leg plyometrics are a great example. I do that all the time. It's like, just jump on one leg, you know, yeah. land in like an athletic power position, maybe sure. six inches forward and then stick it. And like, as like solid a statue as possible. And then pause for five seconds and then do it again and stick it. And then again. And what happens is if most people that haven't done that, they're hopping around, they're shifting their foot and they're really leaking a lot of energy. And so what happens is over time, when they go to do a lift, that energy, I call it like a highway going through the body. It's like a traffic jam and they can't get as efficient through into the bar or whatever it is they're trying to lift. And so sure. the more stable they can be on those jumps, that translates really well to sprinting because they're more forced into the ground, the more fast they can move that direction but also really helps with with lifting and so but it's not it's not sexy it's not sexy to jump hold fight for that position but yeah. like i try to view those as like as prs like oh i got yeah. 10 jumps held each one five seconds stuck through like the discipline from that yeah i highly recommend that it's, it's funny that you bring that up because i've actually started doing like 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 triple broad jumps mm-hmm um and and you're right like when i first started doing them um i i just wanted to keep going and i lose my balance over and over and over and then i started sticking them and like balancing and then going again and and it improved my distance my explosiveness everything so so much but it was hard it's hard to stick to like to land and just stop and not stand up and just wait and then reposition your arms and go again. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, it's like the plyometric single leg jumps. I've been doing those more. Man, they're so, so, so beneficial for me. Totally. Uh, totally. Yeah. It's, I love that. It's like, the, you're, it's like the kipping pull-up versus the pull-up, right? Like the jump yeah. and jump and jump. That's the kipping pull-up versus taking the time to stick it. Yeah. Yeah. Until you roll your ankle. That, that has to be up to that. <laughs> <laughs> That wasn't yeah. good. I'm fine, but <laughs> that ended my my beautiful jumps yesterday. <laughs> oh, dang. I think that focus is super important. That idea of being yeah. able to like, sit there, because I think it is very easy to just kind of move on to the next thing or kind of try to just get this over with. Whereas if you're trying to be really intentional, 
you end up having to just sit with that and just think, whereas it's easy to just kind of cut things short. I know, at least for me, changing from doing like the single leg things of timing, I used to just count in my head, but I realized it's easy to speed things up. So then looking at an actual timer, if, if you have a timer up on the wall or something to actually get to know that sensation of what 10 seconds actually feels like doing something instead of just doing a 10 count, I think is really important. There was, um, I know we're running low on time, but there's something that I wanted to ask you about. I just saw a post a week or two ago on Instagram. I think it was from the Align podcast by Aaron Alexander. He had posted a study about what he called the friendship recession since mm. 1990 the rate of men who had six or more friends has gone from like 50 some percent down to 25 and like one in five single men say they have no close friends. So it was interesting seeing on your website, talking about like men's groups of like trying to help people through that. How, how has that worked for you or what made you decide to get into offering those kind of things? I assume it's tied in. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a friendship, epidemic um and i think it's all these silos that can be created just from like the phone and so we're not able to connect with other people uh, as easily so then we don't feel connected to ourselves and you know phone isn't really going to connect you to yourself and so the men's groups that i run i run you know four or five a year um they're six weeks long and we go over a lot of introspective practices like the ownership and the shooting and then guys are able to practice that throughout the week and then come back on the next call and say, hey, this is my should journal. These are all the shoulds I wrote down. Um, this is how I change them to want. I feel fucking amazing. Like I, my anxiety is, de- is like plung- plunging down. Um, and then they're able to get reflections from other guys. And so it's it's a virtual group and it's been really impactful to allow men the space to, to share some of the things that they're working on and then go out and create like in-person groups where, wherever they live. But developing the individual to have the confidence and the ability to then go and do that and feel positive about that versus it just being a should of like, I should have more friends. This is like this movie um, about, I think it was Paul Rudd or something who was trying to be, he didn't have a best man and cause he didn't have any friends. And so he's like trying to develop these friendships, but I think we're all friends. Like I live with a, a six year old boy. My partner is a six year old and he's a friend machine. And the reason he's a friend machine is he just plays. He just goes and plays with his friends and he's no problem. Be like, hey man, want to play? You want to go chess? And I try to bring that to the gym. Like I'll get Bo, uh, owner of V23 all the time. Like, hey man, you want to do a handstand? Let's try this thing. Can you throw up a kettlebell, catch it, throw it up? How many times can you clap before you catch a kettlebell? Just like weird stuff that's um, – it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. We're able to yeah. like kind of go back and forth and, and play around with it. Or how much weight can you hang um, holding on the on your one arm and hanging from the bar like for 10 seconds? So can you body weight? And then, you know, we'll play around with that and you'll learn certain things. And yeah, I think to answer your question about guys and friendships, I think it's a lack of play because it's really how a lot of us feel most connected and especially physical play. Like, you know, we could play video games with each other online, but that's not going to feel the same as, um, you know, if we're playing sports, maybe like we did when we were younger or, you know, even something outside. Yeah. It could even be camping. It doesn't have to be super physical. I think that is really good. And social media definitely is a double-edged sword because without Instagram, Darren and I wouldn't have met. We wouldn't be having these kind of conversations. Yeah. So I think trying to... Because I think it's a hard framing because so many people, it's interesting you hear them say, I should use my phone less or I should do this. Whereas in reality, I think trying to frame things in somewhat of a positive light or see the benefits of it without necessarily getting sucked into like common threads and everything. Like interacting with strangers, there's very little value with that (laughs) on the internet. But interacting with your friends and giving them encouragement, oftentimes I've found it's easy sometimes to get sucked into reading some discussion thread. And then I tell myself, oh, I should be reading more these days. I read all the time. I just need to read different things because I want to actually finish the books that I have. So I think it's interesting you bring up that idea of play because video games, you're not always 
interacting on a deeper <laughs> level. You're interacting together, but there isn't quite that like physicality or emotional connection. Because I think it's interesting to just, I don't know, thinking about that idea of focusing on bonding and physical relationships is very important, but also emotional connection. Because I think that seems to be a big part of this. If we have more ways to talk to each other than ever, and we have people having less conversations mm -hmm. other than ever, which is surprising. Yeah. Everybody, everybody just likes to argue anymore, like, especially online, right? It's like, that's all anything online is, is an argument. Yeah, I, I got sucked into it on my two hands anyhow, because I had some some haters, some fake weight haters, and I was like, oh man, yeah. come over and lift the weights. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think it goes back to um, why why you're doing those things. And obviously, I use social media, um, but it's a tool, and so I schedule it like, for certain times of my day where I'm very intentional with what I'm doing on this platform. And and I'm not perfect. Like I got called out the other day. One of my buddies messaged me, and um, or actually, I messaged him. And I was like, hey, man, how are things going? He's like, they're great, but I'd much rather tell you in person. Like, can we just talk about in the sauna or something? I'm like, yes, fantastic. And so the amount of like soulful connection that I felt from him and like actually felt like I filled on a friendship level from that hour meeting up with him in the sauna versus an hour of messaging people online is night and day. It just sauna conversations more work. are the best, man. I love sauna yeah. conversations. Those are like the, the best like intellectual moments I think that I, I have. <laughs> totally. They're huge. Yeah. Now there's something about the heat, like releasing, allowing things to come out. Right. It's cool. Yeah, man. We can love it. Love it, man. We're uh we're about a little over an hour and five minutes fast. Let's try to keep it down to about an hour for our listeners. Um, any final words, Mike? Anything you want to tell our audience or how they can find you? I mean, you know, plug your your coaching. You know, anything you want to do, man, go ahead. Yeah. Um, if you want to learn more about me or my coaching, my website's mikeidella.com. Um, and then the main thing I can really get across is the shooting concept. It seems so simple but this is simple things that make the biggest impact. And so if no one takes one thing away from this podcast, it's never uttering the word should and seeing new, new problems will come up because defining what you want is challenging. It sounds really simple, but those are better problems to be, you know, working towards than um, trying to answer the endless expectational shoulds from the outside world that are just going to continue to grow stronger. Yeah, man. Amen to that. I agree hundred percent. Well, man, it was it was awesome to have you, Mike. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Great conversation, uh, and I hope you know maybe we can do it again. And otherwise, I mean, I will see you in V twenty three. I'm sure. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, John. Look forward to meeting you one day. And, yeah, I'll definitely and, have to come out to Colorado. I've been yeah, Colorado. yeah, you do. Heck yeah, and yeah, would love that. Thanks, Darren. Thanks, guys. Support us on Patreon or Anchor and find us on Instagram or Facebook.